Our theme song, we're starting a new uh, theme for the month of October, and uh, we're going to talk about the book of James. Um, it's a small book, and I encourage you all, I challenge you all to read the whole book this month. Um, start this week with chapter one and two, and uh, like I said, it's a very small book, so it, it, it's an easy read. Um, and we're going to talk about, James is sort of like Christianity 101, and how to be a Christian, not just in words and like saying, you know, like when they ask you on different forms, do you have a faith? Yeah, I'm Christian. But how do you practice that, right? Uh, if you're ever taken a yoga class, they talk about our practice, our actual doing. So what is it that Christians actually practice and do? And so that's what we're going to be talking about this month. And we're going to talk about doing the love, doing the love of neighbor and God and self. And so I'm very excited about that. And this is our theme song. It's called All About Love, and we're all learning it. So today we're going to hear the recording of it. And um, the chorus is, it's all about love, it's all about love. So you can, I think you'll pick it up and kind of sing along. Um, or we'll listen to it, and next week we'll, we'll sing and hopefully play it as well. <laughs>
dance in the temple of God. I'm looking forward to Mike doing all these solos next week. <laughs> love. That is indeed what it is all about. And so here from James, um, the select verses from, uh, James is really packed. It's a short letter, but he says a lot. And so I'm pulling together sort of themes um, from it. So I've picked together the themes from chapter one and two that kind of talk about love. And so I challenge you again to go back this week uh, read the whole of chapter one and two because next week we're going to talk about the, the, the parts that I skipped. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the reading is uh, James 1, verses 22 to 25, and then James 2, 1 through 9. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any hearers of the word are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in the mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, not being hearers who forget, but doers who act. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with, buy, with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a, fi, a pers, poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, here, have a seat here, please. While the poor one who is poor, you say, uh, stand over there or, or sit at my feet. Have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And we continue James 2, verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say, I have faith and do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply the bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe, and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, about faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active among his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. I love James. He says it like it is, doesn't he? He says it like it is. Let's sing together step by step because none of us is perfect and none of us does what we say perfectly, but step by step, God will lead us and help us.
have a prayer, joy, or concern, uh, I invite you to text it to our text line. The number is up here. Uh, I think it's 319-33-302-3700. There you go. It's twisted just so I can't read it. Uh, so to send us your text and after a message, we'll, we'll be in prayer for one another and um, share those joys and concerns. Would you pray with me and for me? Gracious and holy God, rescue me from me. Hide me behind your cross so that your word, your message might be heard in our ears, planted in our hearts and grow through our words and our actions so that our lives reflect you and your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray because he said we could. Amen. How many of you like Pinterest? Do you like Pinterest, the little app? Anybody? Oh, Barb admits it. Anybody else admit that you like Pinterest? Love Pinterest. Yay. Pinterest is, uh, if you don't know what Pinterest is, Pinterest is a place on the internet where you can have this account and you can look through all the fun things. Like you can, like, you can, it's kind of like Google with, but it's all pictures and ideas. And so you can like right now, I've been Googling DIY dog Halloween costumes and 10 million ideas for dog Halloween costumes comes right there and you can spend hours scrolling through looking at cute dogs and cute little Halloween costumes and they're amazing and they're adorable and you, you, you know, you can just, Literally, I have thought to myself, okay, I'm just going to sit down for 10 minutes and see if I can find this on Pinterest and realize three hours later that I have been doing this for three hours <laughs> and what a waste of my life, right? Uh, and I have like, people can have what's called boards. It's kind of like, you know, having interest boards where, you know, you put all your backyard ideas and I have a board for my quilting ideas, and I have a board for like, you know, Sunday school ideas, and youth room ideas, and all these different things. And I think I might have 20 boards now because there's so many great ideas. And each board probably has 20, 30, who knows how many great ideas on the board. And they're awesome, and I just love looking at all the ideas. The problem is, the problem is, <laughs> So often those ideas stay on those boards and never become actual things that I make. Because there's too many, right? There's too many ideas, there's too much good stuff. And it's hard to like, you know, focus in and, and figure out what I want to actually do. And Pinterest almost sort of encourages the idea that we're to think about ideas um, but, you know, you have to, like yourself, find the discipline to stop looking at ideas and start doing. And I think the same is true as Christians. Because we, we have grown up in a society in a time, and then this time is over, by the way. But for those of us who are 40 and older, we grew up in a time where Christianity was assumed. It was assumed that you... Uh, were a Christian, it was assumed that you knew who Jesus was, it was assumed that um, you knew what Christmas and Easter and all those things were. That time is now over. Your children and grandchildren do not live in that world anymore, okay? They, that assumption is not no longer in our schools unless it's a very rural school, uh, conservative school. But we grew up in a time, hold on, we're not to prayer time yet, okay? Um, we, we grew up in this time where Christianity was so assumed, and it was assumed that anything you did, you did as a Christian. Anything that was, you know, a good thing was done as a Christian thing. And we no longer live in that world. We no longer live in a world where we can assume that the good things that we do or that people look at us and the good things that we do come from our faith unless we identify it and intentionally practice it as a part of our faith. James calls out the world of ideas, the world of thinking about things, and saying, oh, you know, 
because I think about my faith, because I read books about my faith, because I talk about my faith, I am a faithful person. And he calls that out and he says, hey, faith without works is dead. Everybody say that. Faith without works is dead. Pretty bold stuff. Because we say that we are saved by faith alone, right? That faith is a, that God's gift of salvation is a gift. And it's freely given. And I absolutely believe that to the core of my being. And at the same time, faith without works is dead, right? If we say we have faith, but we aren't doing something about it, if it doesn't move us to challenge our words, to challenge our actions, to challenge the way that we live our lives, then it is dead. I love James. And he lifts up two heroes, and I love the heroes that he picks. He picks Abraham, who is the father of, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And he says, Abraham, who is, you know, praised for his faith, praised because he is the first one to have faith in the one God, the one true God. But he says flat out, if Abraham hadn't followed that God, if Abraham hadn't struck out to leave home when God said leave home, if Abraham hadn't been faithful and listen to God when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son. If Abraham hadn't done the things that God said to do, his faith would not have mattered. That's a pretty bold thing to say about the hero of three major religions, isn't it? That, yeah, he has faith, but if he didn't do anything about it, he would not matter. And then, he's, then he talks about Rahab. Now, some of you might or might not recognize the name Rahab. Rahab is um, a, a character in the Old Testament um, after the exodus from, uh, from Pharaoh, from Egypt, um, as they're entering in the new land. Um, Rahab was a prostitute. She was, uh, but she worshiped the one true God, and she believed in the faith of the Jewish people. And when the Jewish people were coming into the new land and trying to, you know, take over land, she was on their side, and she rescued three men by hiding them in her brothel and saved them. And so James picks out the number one hero of all religions and a prostitute <laughs> and says these two people because they had faith and did something about it. Rahab took a risk. Abraham took a risk to follow and to do what God was calling them to do. Rahab took in people who were wanted by the law, who were wanted to be persecuted and, and possibly killed, and she, she took a risk of her own life and saved them from the government. And so James says, hey, these are two heroes, Abraham and Rahab the prostitute, that you Christians should look at and say to yourselves, am I having faith and works? Or am I just skirting by saying, yeah, I have faith and I do whatever I want to do? And the fun thing is that James gives us some very, very specific things that he thinks that we should do. He says that we should be not just hearers, but doers of the word. Can you say that? Not just hearers, but doers of the word. And so there's some specific things that he says we need to do. Three specific things. Number one, he says flat out, showing partiality to the rich is a sin. If you show partiality, if you are welcoming in somebody who's got like a big title or a big, you know, pocketbook and you're like, oh, hey, how are you? And you give them a great seat and you want to chat with them up. That is a sin. He says flat out. That God loves the poor. 
and that we are to show no partiality between the rich and the poor. And in fact, if we have partiality, we should have partiality for the poor. One of the best, best compliment criticisms I ever got, and I love it, I tell people about this all the time, is I had this uh, little lady in Arnold's Park 20 years, oh gosh, has it been 20 years? Not quite, 18 years ago maybe. She complained. She said, that new pastor, she cares more about the poor than us who are sitting right here in the pews. I said, thank you. <laughs> because that's what God tells us to do. If you're sitting right here in the pews, I believe that you already have faith. You already know Jesus. You already have, have salvation. And that you will tell me what you need. If you need something, you know me. You know where to call me. You know how to get a hold of me. But God says we need to show partiality for the poor, for those who are in need, for those who are hurting, and we need to go and seek out them so that we can help them because they may not know where to get help. They may not know that Jesus loves them. They might not know that the church is a community that they can get support from. Be doers in partiality, not just hearers. And he says that we fulfill the law by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Now, here James shows his rebellious spirit. I love it. James says, you know, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of laws in the Old Testament. And, you know, he even uses the Ten Commandments. And he says, yeah, you can try to keep all those laws. But if you miss one, then you're messed up, right? How about instead of worrying about all these rules and like having a rule checklist, did I do this or that? Am I, am I better or worse than this person because I did this and, and didn't do that? How about if we just forget about all the rules and have a rule of liberty? Doesn't that sound amazing? And that the one rule that we follow is to love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't have to worry about what the, what society says is the rules. We don't have to worry about culture, what our culture says is the rules. What we need to think about is, is this loving? So let me give you an example. The church has lots of rules, right? Lots of rules. One of the rules is you cannot have a baptism that's private. You have to have baptism in a church uh, sanctuary because part of baptism in the United Methodist Church is to have the congregation promise this family that they are going to support you and have the family promise that they're going to raise the child uh, in, the, in the sanctuary in the, of the church. And so one of the big debates for pastors, especially when you go for your first CPE, um, your clinical education in a hospital, is what happens if a child is sick or born sick and, and isn't going to make it, do you baptize them? The rules say no. What is that loving? And flat out, like it's a stupid rule, right? <laughs> it's a dumb rule. I mean, it's got good intentions. It's a good guideline. But there are situations in every, there's, everything is gray, right? Everything is gray. And there are times and places when the most loving thing is to break a rule for the sake of showing grace and love. And so break the rule. Don't worry about the rule if the rule prevents you from loving someone, right? Don't worry about the rule if the rule gets in the way of somebody's feeling God's love. And one of the things I'm very proud of at St. Mark's is that you have made a conscious decision that the United Methodist Church has a rule that we don't do ceremonies for same-sex couples, wedding ceremonies in our sanctuary. And you, as a church, have made the conscious decision, your council, to say we don't like that rule. And we don't care. We don't think that's loving. We think every couple is that loves each other and wants to make a commitment to each other Praise God. God loves that. 
and God blesses that. That God loves and blesses love and commitment, not body parts. And that I'm proud, I'm so proud of that decision. There are lots of rules, but the number one rule is to love. And the third thing that James says that we have to do if we're going to be doers, not just hearers, is to stop judging people and show mercy. And I had to look up, like, okay, what does that mean? Like, what does that Greek word for mercy actually mean? And it means kindness and goodwill with a desire to help, particularly those who are poor, those who are hurting, those who are afflicted. It is kindness and goodwill and a desire to help. And he says flat out, mercy triumphs over judgment. Everybody say that with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That we are not the judges of the world. None of us is qualified. None of us is 100% awesomeness to judge anybody else. We can support each other when we're in a small group and say to, as siblings in Christ, hey, my friend, I've seen you do this. Is that really what God wants you to do? That's not judgment. That's holding each other accountable. But we're not about going around the world and pointing out to other people, hey, God says you can't do that. Hey, God says you can't do that. That is not our job. Our job is to worry about us and say, hey, am I doing what God wants? Am I following the laws of love? Am I not just hearing, but doing my faith? And what we act in the world is mercy, kindness, goodwill. We can believe wholeheartedly that some person has, is living, doing something that we don't like that we personally find offensive or immoral or whatever. But we are not in a position to be judges. We are not in the position, unless you're called up for jury duty, you know, then you are, okay. But, you know, we are not about going out and judging other people. We are about going out and showing mercy, kindness, goodwill. And if somebody receives kindness and goodwill and assistance, then they say, boy, I like what that person has. And they might say, hey, what makes you so kind? What makes you good to me? What makes you talk to me and hang out with me, even though you know this about me? And you can say, Jesus, because Jesus did it. Jesus hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. I did a funeral once. It's probably my favorite funeral I ever did. I did a funeral uh, for the man who owned the strip club in Arnold's Park. And the strip club in Arnold's Park was very controversial because it was right across the street from the middle school. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, it was their first, so it was grandfathered in and Arnold's Park and people didn't like it, but you know, that's the way it was. He died and he had a widow and two teenage children and he had co-workers and employees that were grieving and hurting. And he was not Christian. He was Wiccan. But his parents were Lutheran. And the funeral director called me and said, Pastor Sarah, you're pretty much the only pastor in Northwest Iowa that I think could handle this. <laughs> Would you come do this funeral? And by the way, the after-funeral luncheon is at the strip club. <laughs> the coffee and the donuts were laid out right by the pool on the stage. <laughs> now, I am 100% sure that I went and sat down next to people I didn't know. You know, I got my coffee, got my uh, uh, donut, looked really hard at that strip pole and thought, huh. And then went to sit down with somebody and I'm pretty 100% sure that he was some kind of pimp with uh, some kind of worker uh, because she wasn't really allowed to talk to me. He answered all the questions. 
And I thought to myself, what do I do? Do I like go call the police or whatever? And I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna be as kind and caring and friendly to this two people for 10 minutes as I can. I'm gonna smile at both of them and I'm going to try to leave them with the impression that a Christian pastor did not judge them, cared about them, and was open to hearing about them. I asked about you know, where they came from, background, they were very tight-lipped, but all I wanted them to know is that there was a Christian pastor who was interested and cared I don't know if that made any difference. I will never know if that registered with them or not. I just pray that it planted a seed that someday will grow. And that's all we can do sometimes. Sometimes God will put us in situations with people that we would normally be like, oh, I don't know if I, I don't want to hang out with somebody like that. And what James says to us is, hey, dude, you don't get to judge. What you get to do is show loving kindness and goodwill and plant a seed of love. I want to challenge you. We are in the middle of one of the most contentious campaigns in American history. Yay! How many people are have a recycling bin full of flyers right now? Mm -hmm. And they seem to be growing. They seem to be getting bigger, don't they? I don't know where the money for this stuff comes from. Uh, I want their advertising budget. Um, we are in the middle of a historic moment in our community and in our, our nation. And we can be part of the contentiousness, or we can listen to James, and we can be part of showing mercy, triumphing over judgment. I've heard stories of people who have stopped talking to each other because one's a Trump and one's a Biden and they can't talk about it. Fine, don't talk about it. Talk about the weather, talk about Halloween, talk about dog out costumes for Halloween. I challenge you to meet this campaign with a campaign of love and that this week, you're going to get a sheet uh, that Cindy has as you leave this morning the, of coupons. And they say, love your neighbor. And there's, I think, six of them on the sheet. Cut them out. And I want you to find some people that are the opposite political persuasion that you are. So if you're a Democrat, find some Republicans. If you're a Republican, find some Democrats. If you don't know any Republicans, go look for signs. And, in the, in the, you know, you can just take a walk and find the signs. You, you know, we all can find those. And find something good that you can do for that person. Take a coupon, go get some like, you know, dollar bills or some cookies or candy bars or gum or whatever it is you want to do and write that, you know, hey, I just want you to know I'm a blank supporter and you're a this supporter, but we're all neighbors and I'm trying to love you, neighbor. And leave it on their doorstep or give it to your coworker who you can't stand to talk about politics with or give it to your uncle or whatever spread that we can love each other and be neighbors to each other even in the midst of this difficult contentious time we do not have to buy in as christians to the culture that says republicans and democrats should hate each other that's baloney it has not ha been that way the entire American history, and it does not have to be that way now. We, as Christians, can choose to follow what James is encouraging us to do, to not just hear, love your neighbor as yourself, but do love our neighbors. Our neighbors, even those that we would call our enemies. We need to love them. We need to show goodwill and mercy, kindness. We need to be doers of love. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess it is 
so easy to demonize, to complain, to whine about people on the other side of any issue or any argument. It is so easy to hear your command to love and not do anything about it. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to give us strength, to give us wisdom, to give us insight that today and this week and through the election and past, that we might be doers of your command to love our neighbors and love even our enemies. Help us, O oh God, to show no partiality, no judgment, but to show kindness and mercy and goodwill. Lead us and lead all of your children in choosing to follow you, not just with our faith, and, but with our works, so that we might have life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's take all these things and take a deep breath and lay them before Jesus. Loving Jesus, we lay before you all of our joys and celebrations, and we just thank you for helping us in such a chaotic and difficult time as this to find the joy, the good news, the celebrations. Continue to help us to breathe and to find the places of joy around us. And at the same time, loving Jesus, we pray for those who are in the midst of so much, the hurricanes, the fires, for those who are struggling with teaching online or learning online, for those who are grieving, for those who are missing friends and family, for those who are lonely and struggling with depression and anxiety. Lord God, for all of those, your children, who need you, surround them with your peace and your grace and your love. Help us as your disciples to not just pray, but to live this prayer and to make this world as it is in heaven. For this is what you taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, our closing song is called Do Something. And if you know this song, he kind of talks, he sing talks the verses. So feel free to just sort of like sing talk <laughs> with us, uh, the, the verse part. But the chorus is great fun to sing. And if you just want to sing the chorus, that's fine too. so far down, and how am I ever going to turn around? And I turned my eyes to heaven, and I thought, God, why don't you do something? I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty and children sold into slavery, and thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist to heaven and said, God, why don't you do something?
talking about power God, God's hands and feet, but it's easier to say than to be. Like angels, Kathy, tell her so. It's all right. Someone else will do something. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of life without desire. I don't want a flame. I want a fire. And I want to be the one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. find six somebodies that you can do some loving kindness and mercy and don't be shy don't be afraid don't think oh I know they won't like it or whatever whatever excuse you've got in your head for why you can't do this if you need me to talk you through that I'll help get over it God is saying it's time to do something not just to be hearers, but doers. So go and hear this. You are the hands and feet of Jesus, and you are called to do his work. Go in peace and serve your God. Amen. Let's sing shalom to you now to each other and bless one another as we go out on this beautiful day.